Good afternoon, everyone. I'm John Coleman. I'm the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts. And on behalf of the college, the Department of Economics, and the Heller Hurwitz Economics Institute, I am very, very pleased to welcome you all to the inaugural John Goldstein Memorial Lecture. I especially want to thank John's wife, Ann Patterson, John's daughter and son-in-law, Julia and Christopher, Richard and Ellen Sandor, who established this lecture, and other friends and families of John. The University of Minnesota Department of Economics has a long legacy of producing field-shaping ec economists, and we are proud to honor one of those spe special alumni today, John Heller Goldstein. Since 2010, the Heller Hurwitz Economics Institute has been working to put frontier economic research and theory into the hands of policymakers. The Institute's purpose echoes the important work of its namesake, of its namesakes. Walter Heller, an influential policymaker who was responsible for major policy initiatives such as the federal tax withholding system, launching President Johnson's War on Poverty, and federal state revenue sharing. And economics great Leo Hurwitz, recipient of the Nobel Prize in 2007 for developing the theory of mechanism design, the ability to produce institutions that align, insti that align individual incentives with overall social goals. Through events such as these, the Institute aims to communicate findings, spark dialogue and debate, and inform and influence public policy and practice. And I could say from the perspective of the College of Liberal Arts, it's exactly the kind of work that we appreciate seeing done as we take the work and insights of the experts in our departments as well as invited guests and share them with policymakers and with the community. Before we hear from Professor Greenstone, our featured speaker for the evening, I'd like to invite Dr. Richard Sander to the stage. Richard will share a few words about John Gold Goldstein for whom this lecture series has been named. Richard is the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of, Envi of Environmental Products, LLC, and is widely recognized as the father of financial futures for his pioneering work in developing the first interest rate futures contract in the 1970s. He is the founder of the Chicago Climate Exchange, the world's first exchange to facilitate the trading and reduction of all six greenhouse gases, and recently his firm, Environmental Financial Products, together with CBOE Holdings, launched the American Financial Exchange, an electronic marketplace for small and mid-sized banks to lend and borrow short-term funds. Richard has received several national and international awards, and he received his PhD in economics from the University of Minnesota in 1967. It is thanks to the generosity of Richard, his wife Ellen, and their family that we are able to be here tonight in honor of John Goldstein. So I'd ask Richard to please come to the podium, and I'll ask Professor Vivi Chari to come to the podium as well. I'll, I'll start. Uh, thank you, uh, John. Um, so I thought. Uh, I'm V.V. Chari, I'm director of the Heller Hurwitz Economics Institute, and on behalf of the Institute, I want to echo uh, Dean Coleman's welcome to you. We're all really looking forward to hearing uh, Michael's remarks, and we'll have a, a brief Q&A afterwards. Um, so I did not know John Goldstein uh, personally, but when I look at his work, uh, it was, it's instantly recognizable as the kind of uh, product that one has come to expect of alums of our program. Uh, John Goldstein uh, received his PhD in economics at the University of Minnesota in the early 60s and uh, wrote an important dissertation on wetlands preservation using then fairly modern cost-benefit uh, methods. Um, after a brief stopover at the Claremont Graduate, Graduate School, he then devoted the bulk of the rest of his professional life to, to the service of the federal government, serving first in the Social Security Administration, where, interestingly, he wrote a pioneering piece on lifetime investment in human capital, 
an important component of which I think uh, is present in subsequent work done at the University of Minnesota and elsewhere. Uh, he then served in the Department of Interior and a variety of other departments. At the Department of Interior, he was able to use his special passion, which, which was the environment. Uh, he served as the professional director on the Endangered Species Committee. Uh, that, that committee had the often unpleasant task of deciding which species uh, are not threatened, which are threatened, which are endangered. And the last part was to decide which species were so far gone that um, uh, there was no point in trying to list them on, on any, uh, any list. Uh, that last re part is the reason why that committee was often referred to by unfriendly people as the God Squad. Uh, they were making divine decisions about, uh, about species. Uh, John Goldstein's professional work reveals uh, everything that we have come to expect from Minnesota and from the Heller Hurwicz Economics Institute. Uh, there's a dispassion and a clarity to his work, uh, which is, I think, central to informed policy making. Um, there is often uh, uh, more than a hint that the advice he's offering is not entirely welcome, uh, but there is always the honesty and, uh, and the sense of bringing all of scholarly work to every bit of his, uh, his advice. Uh, so in that sense, uh, I wish I had known John Goldstein personally, but I feel like I know him very well professionally. He is an extraordinary uh, uh, economist and an extraordinary tribute I think, the value of our program. Thanks. Uh, Richard will speak about John Goldstein, the person. Chari, uh, thanks for describing John's professional uh, commitments. I want to just speak about a friend, uh, and I'll try to stay composed if I can. Um, John and I uh, met uh, in the economics department oh, oh, 52 odd years ago, and we never lived in the same city after graduate school, and we maintained a 50-year friendship across thousands of miles and met in different places, and I could not speak to John for three months or six months and pick up the telephone and we'd begin the conversation where we left off three or six months ago. He was also just an inspiring friend for his values and what he brought and, and he didn't take himself seriously, although he was a bit of a curmudgeon. Uh, the world was always filled with a cloud, but there was a way to cheer him up when he decided to do the dissertation on wetlands. A couple of us decided to tell him that he ought to come back to his, his apartment because he had a new roommate. And we had all contributed and bought him a duck. Uh, in honor of his PhD thesis, which he found swimming in his bathtub. Uh, and then the beer began and the laughs began, and he took it with a great sense of your humor and everything that you might imagine. He, I want to talk, it wasn't only me, he took a tremendous interest in my wife Ellen and our work. He took an incredible interest in my daughter, Julie, and my daughter, Pena, and he visited them, whether that was L.A. or when Pena was in Mexico or Julie was, was every place. And so it started with all of those things. It extended, of course, but let me save the best for last to his wife, Anne, and Julia. There wasn't a time that I couldn't call him and say, John, I need some help. So I was teaching at Columbia University in the early 90s. It was a course on environmental finance. 
he was in the midst of the spotted owl. And I said, you got to come down and lecture to the course because I don't know anything about this. <clears throat> but I think there's a chance to create a market in endangered species. John said, oh no, you're at it again? <laughs> and, I, and I said, no, he did come down. And we divided the class into three sections. And one of the class actually designed a market for endangered species, including puts and calls and dangers for then having famous financiers who were later indicted for insider trading to stop squeezes or manipulation and cornering the market in the spotted owl. So we, he inspired a third of the class <laughs> to do a study and a market for saving the spotted owl. Um, I worked uh, a lot in, the, in, in trying to make whatever small contribution I could to uh, climate change and had a crazy idea and call up John. And he was merciless, you know, as a friend. He would really make you make a case, you know. He, he, you couldn't say, John, this is an idea I'd have. He wouldn't applaud. He'd be very judgmental. He'd say, have you thought it through? What are the possibilities? So he was a counselor as well as a friend. And he maintained that enthusiasm for his work very much throughout his entire career and post his retirement. Dan, you may remember his interest in some of the discussions that we had on dams. He was livid that we had built 70,000 or so dams in the United States. Michael Lorenz seekers didn't want to take them down because they could buy electricity at four cents a kilowatt, and you had some of the biggest names in the country refusing to tear down small dams, and it drove John crazy. John's life, you know, um, was almost not to a, a point of completion until he met Anne. And Anne, I think, uh, your years of marriage to him made him the complete man that he ever was. Uh, Julia, the daughter he always wanted. Your daughter, a grandchild that he always wanted. He was a generous man. He was a thoughtful friend. He cared about, as the neighbors in Minnesota, we were just talking in graduate school, he cared about their kids, he cared about my kids. As much as we're here to celebrate the work he did, I'm here to celebrate John the man, John the husband, John the father, and I know John, somewhere up there, you won't admit it, but you're pleased that so many people <laughs> have turned out on your behalf. And most of all, I'm so pleased because if there was one person in America today who I think represents the epitome of work in climate change, it's Michael. And I think the very fact that you've taken the time, Michael, would have pleased John to no end because your work is profound, it's brilliant, and it has practical implications. And that's all what John would have loved. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. As Richard mentioned, we are pleased to have Professor Michael Greenstone as our featured speaker this evening. Michael is the Milton Friedman Professor of Economics and Director of the Energy Policy Institute at the University of Chicago. His research estimates the costs and benefits of environmental quality and society's energy choices. He's worked extensively on the Clean Air Act and examined its impacts on air quality 
manufacturing activity, housing prices, and human health to assess its benefits and costs. In 2009-2010, he was the chief economist for the President's Council of Economic Advisors. Before we welcome Professor Greenstone to the stage, I want to say I was in this room a few weeks ago delivering the much anticipated, of course, State of the College address. And I have to say, Michael, you, drew a, you draw a much larger crowd than I did <laughs> for that. With that, please welcome Professor Greenstone. Okay, uh, thanks very much for the invitation. Uh, with uh, introductions like that, uh, I'd be happy to go anywhere, really. But <laughs> Okay, let's see if I can operate the computer here. So let me just start by saying uh, what an honor it is to be here today. Uh, it, I did not know John Goldstein, but sounds like a man to have uh, modeled oneself after, and uh, of course I'm happy to see the Sanders and uh, happy to be the University of Minnesota. So this is, uh, I couldn't help myself, uh, so I don't play hockey, I don't actually like hockey, I don't <laughs> know anything about hockey, but I couldn't help myself with the title since we're in Minnesota, uh, and it actually fits, uh, sometimes my titles don't fit the paper, uh, but this one actually is related. So the, what I'm going to talk a little bit about is, uh, is it possible to have an energy hat trick? Uh, and so if you want to remember one thing about what an energy hat trick is, uh, is it possible to have access around the world uh, to inexpensive and reliable energy at the same time uh, that we don't manage to uh, have air pollution that causes uh, people to lead greatly shortened lives and that we don't set the planet on fire. Uh, and so what I'll try to talk about uh, today is uh, how to manage between those three goals, not all of which point in the same direction. Okay, and so uh, I'm much more comfortable, and I think you'll get a sense of that as we go along, with uh, figures and numbers and things like that. Uh, and uh, my wife was an English major, and so I've always kind of felt a shortcoming with respect to my uh, artistic abilities and sense, appreciation of humanities. Uh, and then you add to that that I have my two artistic cousins here tonight, uh, and so I thought I'd start with a picture. Uh, all right. This picture has everything uh, that maybe you need to know about the energy challenge or maybe the uh, energy hat trick that we're going to aim for here. So it's really an incredibly fascinating picture, uh, at least for me, as you start to dive into it. So first of all, this is Beijing. Uh, uh, for those of you who have been there, uh, you can literally recognize, you can recognize what you, it's just palpable when you're in China. It, it's a country on the make. Uh, and you can see the motion and you can feel the motion. You can see it was not long ago that the guy in the cab here was on the other side of that gate and was probably on a bike, and the guy on the bike not long ago was on the other side of the far gate and was probably walking. Uh, and in another blink of an eye, the guy on the bike's going to be in a car for sure. Uh, and that has all been, not entirely, but largely produced by energy consumption. Uh, those gained this, you know, practically historically unprecedented increase in well-being and reduction uh, in poverty over a really short period of time, 25 years, has gone hand in hand with tremendous uh, increases in energy consumption. And so they're going to want more, and then I'm going to talk more about that, and other parts of the world are going to want more. So that's part one. That's the first, I guess we would say in Minnesota, the first goal. Uh, the second, you can see it's the middle of the day. Uh, anyone who's been to China in the last period of time recognizes that. It's the middle of the day and you can't see the sun. Uh, and you see lots and lots of air pollution there, and that air pollution is a, out, a byproduct, not an intended, but an unintended byproduct of all the energy consumption. That's because they're using fossil fuels, primarily. And then the third goal is, you can't actually see it, but you know it's there. Uh, and that's the release of the CO2 uh, and those greenhouse gases. And those are not causing, uh, so while the air pollution, which by the way our guy here can see, he's got the mask on, he's got the gloves on, it's not that guys are unaware of it. Um, the third part is the CO2 and uh, kind of dis the potential for disruptive climate change and, and, in a way that threatens uh, our, uh, how we're used to living. So this is the challenge. We'll now kind of seed you with 
what I'm going to call seven facts. And then at the end, I'll, I'll try and uh, give you uh, some high-level policy implications, which are all going to seem very easy. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit why that maybe they're not so easy. So the first is uh, energy is so the first fact is energy is critical to growth. Uh, and I, I like to uh, th this figure. So for those of you who love data, like I love data. Uh, so on the x-axis, we've got total energy consumption. On the y-axis, we have GDP. And you, you, you can see the relationship is really very tight. Uh, and so, but for those of you who love data, uh, this, this never happens. Like, data is like the worst boyfriend or girlfriend you ever had. Like, every time it, like, disappoints you in a way that you couldn't quite have imagined uh, <laughs> before it happens. Uh, uh, and this is an example of data not disappointing you. We do not have on the historical record increases in uh, standards of living without lots more energy consumption. And, you know, I've picked out a few countries uh, there, but the key thing to note is you, we just don't have high standards of living in the observable data without lots of energy consumption. All right, so that's fact one. So, and remember, not everyone was at the levels of the U.S. Uh, number two, energy access is a major problem. So these are, you know, there's, as I said, I'm more comfortable with numbers. Uh, but this slide will have some numbers that I think might be hard to get out of your head. They're certainly hard to get out of uh, my head. And so you could just start with the annual uh, electricity consumption per capita in the United States. It's about 13,300. Uh, we've also got 300 million people. And then I, I circled uh, China and India. So first of all, they have 1.3 billion people, maybe a little bit more. Uh, it's an amazing number of people. And look at the electricity consumption. So China is at 3,300, so they're at about a quarter uh, of what the U.S. is. Uh, and India is at about 700. I don't think anyone in India thinks that 700 is the right number. They might not think 13,000 is the right number either. But we're going to be in for lots of increases in energy consumption. Right now there's, uh, and it's going to be coming from these countries that are very low levels. Uh, without going into, you know, too much detail about particular research projects, the state of Bihar, it's worth highlighting. It's got 100 million people. They have per capita electricity consumption there is 122 kilowatt hours per year. So that's like, as a little cartoon on the side says, it's, that's like a, a 60 watt bulb six hours a day. Okay, so energy access is a major problem. And that bleeds right into the next point. Uh, which is that today's developing countries are going to increase energy consumption. And I'm going to start to connect some points here in a minute. But uh, so this is just the red line is the expected growth between 2010 and I guess 2040 in uh, energy consumption measured in quadrillions of BTUs. The units aren't important. Uh, and the key thing is they're going to get about a doubling, the, uh, the develop today's uh, non-OECD countries. And the OECD countries are going to be... Uh, particularly flat. And when, if you look at, the, if you remember the previous chart, it's not surprising. That's where the growth is all projected uh, to come. There's not expected to be a lot of growth in the OECD countries. All right. Number four, uh, fossil fuels, that's coal, natural gas, and petroleum, to first approximation, are really cheap. Uh, and not only are they cheap, they're hugely abundant. And that is, uh, going to interact with the last two facts as we go along, but let's just put some numbers on that. So what does that mean in practice? So this is from a paper of mine. It, uh, these numbers are going to vary from location to location. This is maybe two years old. Uh, it's in the U.S. And this tells you how much it costs to produce a kilowatt hour of electricity. Um, the first bar is an existing coal plant. It costs 3.2 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, it's uh, you know, very, very cheap, as you can see, compared to others. New coal plants are 6.2 cents per kilowatt hour. They're more expensive because uh, the environmental controls that are required. And uh, a new natural gas plant after the fracking revolution is about 5.5 cents per kilowatt hour. So that's what it costs to produce electricity using fossil fuels. And now, uh, to the extent that one wants to think about, well, how would we prevent having uh, uh, disruptive climate change? You have to start to point towards fossil fuel, uh, non-fossil fuels or renewables or low carbon energy sources. And here are some estimates of what they would cost. Uh, so a, first, a nuclear plant is about nine and a half cents, 9.4 cents a kilowatt hour. 
Uh, and again, that might not seem like much, but remember that's basically a tripling uh, compared to a new coal plant. I should say my best guess is that that number is probably higher. We don't, uh, we're not building nuclear plants anymore in the U.S. I don't think we really have a sense of what they cost, but that, that, that's a guess. Uh, a wind in a pretty good location for wind, so a windy location is about nine cents a kilowatt hour, and a solar PV is about uh, 12.2 cents a, a kilowatt hour. So the important point I just want you to take away from this is if we're going to make some energy transition away from the fossil fuels to the renewables or the low carbon energy sources, what you're really talking about, if you cut through all of it, is tripling or maybe quadrupling uh, the price of energy. Now, in some situations, it'll, it won't be quite a triple or a quadruple, but the key fact is it, it, it will be more expensive. Uh, and that's not just a problem, or that's not just an issue for today. Uh, I think what has, while there have been great advances in uh, bringing down the cost of renewables in the last several years, particularly in the last five years for solar, uh, what is sometimes lost in that conversation is the incredible advances that there have been in finding fossil fuels in uh, very inexpensive ways. And so the red bars here are uh, shale deposits, uh, and you can see in the United States, and so this is, this is where the fracking revolution has happened in the U.S., uh, but you can see that those shale deposits are actually all over the world. Uh, and thus far, we haven't really started to access them anywhere besides the United States and maybe Canada a little bit, uh, but there's a lot more fossil fuels coming, I think is uh, what I want you to take away from that. Uh, it's not that we're, those prices I showed you are the prices today and uh, things are about to equalize, uh, there's a lot of fossil fuels in the world. And so I think uh, this is also my effort to be artistic. Um, you know, this is coal. Uh, and when people talk about the fracking revolution, there's uh, the idea that it's uh, natural gas can be the bridge uh, to the uh, green future, the blue bridge to the green future. There's also, you know, an alternative view, and this is admittedly as coal, is that maybe there's just a really, really long fossil fuel bridge. And this kind of gives uh, some sense of that. Okay. Uh, so, well, that's fine. Fossil fuels are cheap. Looks like people are going to want to use them. Uh, why might we not want to use them? So let's dive into that a little bit. Uh, and the first and probably most salient reason, I think, uh, for the countries that are going to uh, it, we're projected to have these large increases in energy consumption, is that fossil fuels cause pollution and they harm health. And so this is, uh, I, uh, I'm trying not to dive deep into uh, my kind of highly academic work, but here's a, uh, some new research that is not yet a paper, but that I think helps speak to this. And it's uh, revisiting a paper that I did uh, a couple years ago that demonstrated uh, the costs in terms of life expectancy of air pollution in China. This is using some updated data from a more recent period. Uh, and the idea of this paper uh, is that it's very hard to find settings where it is possible to estimate the effect of air pollution on human health, and that's because people might, if, who are unhealthy might choose to live in less polluted places, or people might engage in all kinds of behavior to protect themselves. Uh, and so what one really needs is a natural experiment. Uh, we're never going to have an experiment where we randomly assign pollution to people. And what this paper uh, takes advantage of is a Chinese policy uh, that dates from the planning period. Uh, and in the planning period, China was not as wealthy as it is today. And there just wasn't enough money to provide winter heating for everybody. Uh, and so what they did in a very arbitrary way was draw a line across the middle of the country. That's the blue line there. It actually follows the river, the Huai River. Uh, and they said, if you're north of the Huai River, uh, you have free winter heating. And that's because we're going to give you free coal. And we're going to build really small boilers all over the place. And we're going to give you free coal. And you can burn it. Uh, and uh, that's meant to keep people warm. It's, and it uh, surely was very successful. And relatedly, though, is, uh, it, it's just worth noting, there's a lot of places that are actually, uh, so Chengdu is a good example. I've given a lecture there before. It's in the northern part of the south. Uh, it can be pretty cold there. And as a measure of uh, not just that there was free heating in the north, but heating was forbidden in the south. 
Uh, and so when I gave a lecture in Chengdu there, I think in January or February, it was a room like this, all the students had on winter coats. That was just the way it is, there's no indoor heating. So the idea of this paper is, well, we have this really kind of interesting thing where as you cross the river's edge, there's a discrete change in the availability of heating and a discrete change in the use of coal. And so what are the consequences of that? And that's what the paper sets out to measure. Uh, and so this is maybe, uh, let me, there's a lot of numbers and bubbles here, but let's just make this simple. Uh, the zero line here is uh, the river, uh, and the bubbles are uh, places that people live, uh, and you could see as you move here, you get further and further north of the river, and as you move this way, you get further and further south. And so the idea of the study is, well, what would happen if you could compare people who live just to the south to just to the north, and they, where the, in principle, the only thing that is discreetly changing is this policy. Uh, and what I'm measuring is uh, particulates air pollution. It's the most pernicious form of air pollution. And what you can see is that there really is this discrete jump uh, in air pollution, right as you cross the river's edge uh, from the south to the north. Uh, and it turns out to be about 50 percent, or uh, for those of you who are fans of uh, a measurement of particulate matter, it's 43 micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, really an enormous difference uh, in air, uh, air quality. And so that's the first half of the paper. And the second half of the paper is, well, what does that mean for people's lives? Uh, and uh, after maybe like a decade of like trying to kick in doors in China and get access to data, including a failed effort to send the mother of one of my graduate students uh, to the library there and check out some books. Uh, I finally got access to that data. And so I was able to measure life expectancy. And again, the idea of this paper is what happens as you move just from the south to the north. And what's striking is that the guys in the north, uh, the guys in the uh, south who were not the beneficiaries, intended beneficiaries of this policy, uh, appear to be living about three and a half or four years uh, longer than people in the south. And so you really have this mirror image. Uh, you had the higher pollution on the north and lower life expectancy. Uh, and what it helps to do is to drive home what the cause, uh, consequences are of a reliance on fossil fuels and uh, the reliance of that fossil fuels, what the co uh, consequences are for human health. You know, it's worth noting, uh, so where was all that energy consumption, increase in energy consumption going to occur? A lot of it's going to occur in India, a lot of it's going to occur in China. This is a map of PM uh, 2.5, it's another measure of particulate matter around the world. And you can see those places are already pretty polluted. Uh, and you can also see that this problem of particulate matter is a problem uh, that's a, a global problem, although it's largely concentrated uh, in developing countries. Okay, so that was fact five. Fossil fuels uh, cause pollution and they harm health. Uh, and then fact six is that fossil fuels also cause climate change. Uh, I think that's pretty well established. I've once in a while given a talk in places where that was not quite as established. Uh, that I always enjoy those talks because you can, you can feel the angst coming. Uh, and I just leave a little bait and wait till they come out and say it, and then I smack them in the head, and then I go back. Uh, but I, I'm not getting that sense here, but if in the question and answer, we can always play that game if you want. Um, okay, so here's uh, predictions of what will happen to global temperatures based on uh, six scenarios. Uh, on the, uh, the, by the end of the century, on the x-axis, we got years, and on the y-axis, we've got what's going to happen with uh, some uncertainty bounds. Uh, and you can see that global mean temperatures are projected to go up a, a, according to these models, maybe by three and a half or four degrees C. Uh, I always have a hard time with that. And when I was in grade school, uh, the teachers were constantly threatening us, you know, tomorrow we're going to switch to the metric system. Uh, you really have to learn, and then it never really happened. So the C never really stuck, uh, for me at least. So I'm going to now try and unpack that with F. F is a little bit easier for me to understand. Uh, and I want, so this is only through 2100, but this is like a little piece that I wrote up in the New York Times that helps to, I think, underscore the magnitude of the climate challenge. Uh, and it 
takes, so, and uh, the climate scientists kind of drive me crazy. First, they use C. I don't understand that, as I said. The second thing is they all talk about in gigatons of CO2. I also don't really know what that means. Uh, and really, at the end of the day, what I can relate to are degrees. Uh, and so what I've, all I've done is I've converted, I'm going to show you a graph of how much carbon uh, we have in the world, except I'm going to convert it into uh, degrees. So thus far, we've burned enough carbon. We baked in 1.7 degrees Fahrenheit of warming. Uh, and then what I want to show you is the climate challenge that we have is the next category here is fossil fuel uh, reserves. So that's coal, natural gas, and oil. Reserves are, uh, the energy industry has a funny way of talking about things, but reserves are deposits that we know are there and that we know we can get with today's technologies and we know we can get with today's prices. So if you assume that, if you assume we pull all those out of the ground, then we're going to get another 2.8 degrees. So we're at four, uh, now four and a half. And now here's, the, in a couple of these like oblong shapes, you will uh, really start to be nervous, but let's start to unpack them slowly. So uh, the next is oil and gas resources. We know it's there. Uh, we know the technology to, that can get it. Uh, we just need higher global prices uh, to make it economical to pull it out of the ground. So that's uh, 3.1 degrees. Uh, and then the last category, which you notice I haven't put here, is coal. And coal is really astonishing. There is coal everywhere. Uh, and it is not, uh, you know, today's prices, it's not that easy to, it's not that economical, but it's there. And so if you added all this up, there's about 16 degrees of Fahrenheit warming that's embedded in the planet. Um, and by the way, the guys at Schlumberger and the guys at Exxon are working day and night to make sure to increase that number, and they're very, very good at it. Uh, and I, I don't mean that lightly. Like the fracking revolution, which they, you know, they and other companies like theirs helped unleash, was really, you know, a sign of uh, ingenuity. And but at a minimum, this stuff is here. And if we're not going to have so 16.2 degrees Fahrenheit, what does that actually mean? What does life on the planet look like? I don't know, but it's a, you know, it's a massive change, uh, and I think one that would be very, very complicated for uh, life to go on in the way we know it. So the challenge is going to be not to use that, uh, and that's kind of the heart of the, uh, much of the heart of the climate challenge, so, or not to use all of it. Here's one more thing that I just wanted to put up. Because uh, I still, all that was in uh, what's going to happen to global mean temperatures. I also think what's going to happen to global mean temperatures is a little bit strange if it's going to go up four degrees. I don't really, the, again, it's a little bit of a hard concept to understand. So here is a different way that I think is a little bit easier to access. This is the distribution of days in the year. It happens to be in India, uh, where the temperature is going to fall in, I guess, uh, two degree wide bend, three degree wide bend. So this is uh, 79 to 81, and you can see the average Indian currently has about 60 days a year, where it's going to be between 79 and 81. And this is the average of the high and the low, so it's not just the high. And they're going to have, uh, you know, let's call this 15 days a year, where it's going to be between 91 and 93. So you can see India is a hotter country uh, than the U.S. But so this is the distribution of days that the average Indian faces today. If we had climate change proceed in a business as usual way with no real plan to slow it down, this would be the distribution. Uh, and you would see this huge piling up, and it's a little bit easier to relate to this than to understand what four degrees increase in global mean means. And you'd have the number of days, that, you know, 91 to 93, go from 15 to almost 30. And, you know, enormous increases, 94 to 96, and enormous increases, uh, grade 97. And that, why that's important, so why I displayed it like this is, global mean temperatures, it's a little bit hard to relate to, this, that's where all the bad stuff is. The bad stuff is at the high temperatures. That's where you got the health problems. That's where you got the crop stuff. Uh, and so climate change is uh, hopefully now I've uh, exposited in a, a way that is a little bit different than you're used to. Okay, so now let's just, before I leave the climate change uh, component of this, I also want to talk about what we saw earlier, which was A, fossil fuels are the cheapest, B, there's going to be lots of increase in energy consumption, and it's all going to occur in today's developing countries. 
so let's, with that in mind, let's just take a look at this. So here what I've calculated is the predicted uh, cumulative share of greenhouse gas emissions by country. So the first bars are not predicted. That's historical. We've measured that. So China and India have only accounted for 16% uh, of greenhouse gas emissions that are in the atmosphere today. The U.S., 22%. But what is projected to happen as the century evolves? Uh, and what you can see is that China and India, are, by the middle of the century, will have accounted for 30% of historical emissions. Uh, the US will be down to 16%. Uh, and uh, China and India will be up to 37% by the end of the century, and the US will be down to 12%. So that's not to say that the US doesn't play an important role in all of this. But what it underscores is that where we need the reductions uh, in greenhouse gas emissions going forward are the very places where people are today the poorest. Uh, and that is a painful truth uh, about climate change, is we might want it because it's going to make our, we, we don't want to face the risk, but these are countries where you have people today dying effectively from being poor. Uh, you know, it manifests itself through disease and all kinds of other things. And that's what makes, I think, uh, complicates uh, the, the, the climate challenge. Okay, so then the last fact, which I think will help us round into what we might want to do from a policy perspective, is that uh, energy is mispriced around the world in at least two different ways. Uh, and uh, so remember, one of the goals of the energy challenge uh, or the hat trick is to actually increase energy consumption in today's developing countries. And what I will, what I'm going to argue today is that a paradoxically, a huge constraint on that is that energy is treated like a right. It's not treated as a uh, private good. And because it's treated like a right, uh, that means people expect it uh, to be free. Uh, and so here's an example, so just let me put a fine point on this. Here are the operating losses of the electricity companies in, uh, as a percentage of uh, revenue, or as a percentage of their, their uh, output uh, in a selected set of countries. So you can see the OECD countries are like five and a half or six percent. That's just due to, most of that's just due to some of the electricity being lost as it travels across the wires. Um, and so you should think of that as like a baseline. It's hard to be much below that. But you have a whole set of other countries, India and Pakistan really being important examples, uh, where they're losing, in India's case, maybe 22 or 23 uh, percent of that. So that is the distribution. So try to imagine running a business uh, where it costs you a dollar to make the product and you only get 77 cents back. So that's not going to work for very long. Uh, and so what happens? Uh, so how do the companies do that? Well, they're not private companies. The government owns them. And the government effectively gives them some relatively small amount of money each year and says, you can lose this. And so then how do the distribution companies stay in business? It shuts down uh, and it restricts supply. And so that's what leads to you know, very low levels of electricity supply uh, in developing countries. And so you kind of have this circular problem. Uh, the company puts the electricity on the wires that people don't pay, uh, and so then the company has to pull back on how much uh, it offers. So that's one huge problem. Uh, the fact that there is really not, uh, it's not treated as a private good, and I think that's central to increasing access uh, to energy. Uh, the second is energy subsidies are huge, uh, and they fail to uh, target the poor. So here, the red dots are the percentage of GDP that they cost in various countries, which you can read off the right axis here. Uh, Iran spends a lot, but a lot of other countries uh, spend a lot on in energy subsidies as well. And what's really striking about that is that they're often, people talk about them as a way to be a form of redistribution, uh, but they really do kind of a bad job of hitting the poor. So uh, only 6% for natural gas subsidies actually hit people in the bottom 20% of the income distribution. Now, when you think about it, it's not very surprising. Like, poor people don't consume a lot of anything. Uh, and so if these goods are being subsidized, uh, the poor guys are not going to get that much of it, uh, uh, of the subsidy. So that's another uh, problem with energy, and it makes energy uh, used in very inefficient ways. Uh, as one example in India, which is a country I do a lot of work in, you know, farmers don't pay anything for electricity. 
Uh, and so in a lot of states in India, and they mainly use electricity uh, to water their crops, uh, and they do it in a very inefficient way, and it's actually causing the earth, uh, causing the ground to sink into the earth uh, as they're drawing down the water table. All right, and then the last way in which energy is so very obviously mispriced uh, is that it, there's a real favoritism towards fossil fuels. And what's that favoritism? Uh, that favoritism is, we looked at this before, and I was saying, wow, it's really fabulous. Uh, these fossil fuels are so cheap, it's going to be irresistible for people not to use them. Uh, well, that's true that they're cheap, but then my facts kind of kept piling on, and when you take account of the full costs uh, of these energy uh, sources of energy, they're actually not so cheap. Uh, and the full costs have to include the air pollution and the health problems that go along with it. Uh, we saw in China that guys in the north are living four years less than guys in the south because of the uh, use of coal, uh, as well as uh, the climate damages associated with them. And what's fascinating is if you were uh, to price those damages, and we could probably spend about 28 hours talking about how you do that, uh, the name of the game changes quite a bit. Uh, and so coal, which looked like a great deal before and irresistible to use, uh, now does not look so good. It actually, some of the renewables uh, and low carbon energy sources actually look like they can compete with coal. Natural gas, at least in the U.S., where we have very inexpensive natural gas, uh, suddenly looks like a real winner. And uh, you can see some of the, as I said, some of these low carbon ones uh, start to look better. But to a first approximation in most parts of the world, certainly including the United States, we do not have pricing that reflects it. And so that really, due to the structure of the markets, leads to uh, excess reliance uh, on fossil fuels. Okay, so what are the policy implications? And I, I think I'm running out of time here. So we'll just go back to this picture. Uh, uh, we'll take note of my desire, a latent uh, desire to be artistic. Uh, and the energy challenge or hat trick is all embedded in that picture. Uh, I think the policy implications or how we can get from where we are today to where we would like to be are at some level at a high level, pretty simple. Uh, there's a, virtual a virtuous circle between uh, getting, having elect energy treated as a private good uh, and energy supply, and then the growth that we started with. Um, and so finding, uh, so there, I think there's potentially large benefits to increasing repayment rates. Uh, the second is energy subsidies are ex very expensive and exacerbate inequality. Uh, and it's hard to make a case for them. Uh, the, I think there's lots of opportunities to replace these subsidies uh, with direct payments to uh, the lower income households. And then, you know, there's an element of the holy grail here. If we could find a way to set up energy markets so that they ref the full costs were reflected, uh, there would be great opportunities for bringing in the sources of energy that don't have all these problems uh, associated with them. Okay, and I'll just make this point. You know, these policy implications, they're very, at some level, they're very easy to say. Uh, and I think what has proven quite challenging uh, over the arc of history is that they're a lot easier to say than they are uh, to implement. And I think some of the most exciting research uh, I, uh, out there right now, uh, certainly which I'm trying to contribute to, is how do you find policies that are both achieve these goals and are politically feasible, and so that they have to take account of the incentives of all the local actors. And uh, that might be something that will come out in the Q&A, but I think that's really the frontier of what we need to crack. Um, and since we have the Paris Climate Talks coming, I couldn't help but uh, make one extra slide for you as kind of a bonus. Call this the bonus. Uh, figure in economics. Uh, so what will happen uh, due to the climate negotiations uh, that will take place in uh, December in Paris? Uh, so just so you have a sense, so I, made, I, I made this chart. So here's the change in global mean temperature. This is what the scientists say it shouldn't exceed. Uh, this is what emissions would have to look like over the course of the century, they would really have to turn down, and they're basically zero by the end of the century. Uh, the blue one is the no action. You could think of that as business as usual. 
uh, suppose we really didn't have any climate policy. Uh, and you can see that, that we're on a course by the end of the century to have, uh, without any real policy, uh, about 8 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, for those of you who were paid attention to your second and third grade teacher, that's 4 and a half degrees C. Uh, and uh, if the Paris, agree, uh, what countries have promised to do in Paris, uh, they actually hold. There's, there will be, uh, it's not binding, but if it were to hold, you would end up with 3 and a half C. Uh, or maybe 6.3 degrees Fahrenheit. So you could look at that as half empty or half full, um, but it, you know it's lower than the blue, li uh, blue line, but it is still uh, much higher than the green line. And what I'll say is I think that the reason that we really, there's any progress on this, uh, is not because guys in China woke up and said, you know, we really want to focus on uh, climate change, but because I think they began to realize that the political costs of the air pollution uh, really play a great or a threat to the regime there. And I think uh, if you want to leave this in a slightly happy place, I think the increasing recognition uh, of the costs of air pollution are a path to where we can also do, uh, do something uh, with climate change. So thank you very much, and I look forward to Q&A. Really awesome. So um, we have a few minutes. Why don't we take some questions uh, out there? When you get up, please do identify yourselves uh, for the uh, for this. But let me <coughs> let me um, uh, kick this off by talking about something that you talked about at the very end, uh, which is. Um, so one of the, the hardest things to do is to solve global public goods and global externalities uh, problems. Uh, but one of the promising things that you identified is this is a case where there are complementarities between solving very local kinds of problems and that helps to contribute. So um, in some sense, this is this is hard to do. Suppose that we see, let me start in a slightly different place in order to explain where this would come from. One question about the Paris talks and the agreements is uh, how enforceable uh, these agreements will be and how much they will be enforced. To the extent that there are strong complementarities between solving local problems and solving global problems, then they're more likely to be achieved just because they're going to solve local problems. What's your sense about the enforceability more generally of the kinds of agreements people are coming up with? How likely is it that we'll end up carrying forward on it? How, how much of a role will these yeah. complementarities play? So first, let me make, I won't quite answer your question and I'll come to it. Uh, I was curious about that and so I went back and looked at the Kyoto Protocol uh, which was a previous climate agreement, uh, which actually did have much more enforceability uh, than uh, the Paris Agreement will have for sure. And although countries could opt out, uh, Tokyo, I'm uh, sorry, Canada opted out, I think Japan opted out uh, halfway through. And what was surprising to me is countries actually did better than they promised. Uh, I think they did about 10% better, even when you throw out Eastern Europe, uh, which basically complied by having an implosion in their economy. <laughs> uh, 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 countries were overshot by maybe 10%. And it's an empirical fact. So, okay. okay so that, all right. Now, all right, all right. there's always an issue about identification here about how much of that was due to the accords and how much of that. No, no, so, uh, absolutely. But I was, I was surprised because I thought that uh, they would never fall through. So, I think um, with respect to what we could expect out of Paris. I think the path forward is the air pollution and increasing recognition of it. And e indeed, even when you look at the U.S.'s, uh, the administration put out a uh, uh, RIA, so I'm sure everyone reads those all the time, regulatory impact analysis. Very good to read if you're having trouble sleeping. Uh, and where they laid out the case, the U.S. case for uh, the Clean Power Plan, which is to reduce CO2 emissions. And 50% or some very high fraction of it is domestic benefits from reductions in air pollution. Uh, and so I just think it is too hard politically to 
do things that are pay off in 30, 40, 50 years anywhere in the world uh, that only, that, where that's the only benefit. And it's difficult in the United States and probably irresponsible in poor countries today. Uh, and so I think that the path is through the local externalities. And so that, that will in, lend some enforcement. I don't know if it'll get all the way there, but. The, the local externalities, I think, is, is potentially important because the picture you were showing of Beijing, just so you know, uh, I went to graduate school in Pittsburgh. And so at the, at the Hellman Museum in Pittsburgh, there are photographs from the, ninth, from the late 40s and those photographs look exactly like the photograph of Beijing that you showed. No, uh, no it's astonishing. There's, there, it's not just Pittsburgh, but it, there, when you look at pictures basically from the early 70s backwards into the 40s, they, they look like Beijing. Yeah, and so, and they, we didn't, those uh, c cities, th those states, and we as a nation didn't do that for climate change. We did it entirely because people didn't particularly care for it once they had enough to eat and nice clothes to wear. A question back there? Uh, thank you. Please identify yourself in this. Sorry. Uh, oh. Rolf, uh, Rolf Nordstrom with the Great Plains Institute, and thank you for a great, uh, a great talk. I just have a clarifying question about fact number one. Are you, um, is, the, is the suggestion or is the fact that there needs to be a growth in energy use to see growth, to see GDP growth. And it's a bit of a leading question because I'm thinking in my head, or I was as you were presenting that, that it seems like not very many, but I can think of a few cases where you begin to see some decoupling of the growth in energy use from growth in GDP. Yeah. So, so I think you can get the magnifying glass real close up on a couple years of data and you can, and I know there's been a lot of talk about the decoupling in the last year or two, but to a first approximation, we do not have historical uh, examples of substantial increases in well-being without substantial increases in energy. The question. Bob Tammon, Sudan, Minnesota. I see your numbers for the cost of wind power, 9.9 .9 cents per kilowatt, backed up. Now, I've been retired a few years, so I'm, my numbers are old, but I recall talking to a small producer was being paid 3.15 cents a kilowatt at the meter where the power left his windmills to go into the system. So. Could you give us some idea how much we're paying or how much you're allocating to the cost of backing up our wind power? Yeah, that's excellent. So a uh, very sharp eye. So the, there's an issue with renewables, which everyone understands at some guttural level, which is uh, that the sun doesn't uh, shine all the time and the wind doesn't blow all the time, and the electricity grid needs things that can be accessible all the time. So to put things on an even scale, I created a Frankenstein plant, which is, uh, has a natural gas plant right next to it. And it turns on, in my simulation, whenever the wind isn't blowing, the sun isn't uh, shining. And that's probably a legitimately more expensive way uh, than the alternative, but uh, th 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 then would be used in practice. But it, it's meant to be illustrative. So I think what is often missed in the, th the story about the 3.1 cents is those are often very specialized situations in very, very windy places. A, B, there's the production tax credit, uh, and there's like a series of very hidden subsidies uh, that make it profitable for wind producers uh, to produce uh, at what seem like very uh, low, uh, low prices. So, you know, whether, so it, it's not 3.1, maybe it's seven, I don't know, but the key thing is it's more expensive uh, than fossil fuels and uh, in almost all locations. And there aren't that many locations uh, where wind is, can produce at such low, at those anecdotal prices that we hear about all the time. Yes, hi, I'm uh, Ellen Sandor. We've got a mic. Yes, all right. Yes, thank what you have to say is sufficiently uh, important first, that everybody yes, should thank hear. You. Yes, thank you everyone for coming here. So um, I was ex very excited when the Premier of China discussed something. Will you talk about that and what you think about 
what's going to happen. And I'm very proud of Jerry Brown with what he's doing in California. So this is a policy center, correct? And there's actually policy that's beginning to happen. So I was curious what you think. Yes, this is personal. <laughs> <laughs> so I think what the premier did in 2013 was announce a war on pollution. And that was, I think, like the inflection point with respect to China. Uh, I think that was, I don't think a reasonable person could have predicted that was going to happen even a year before. Uh, and that was partially a function of increasing awareness of the health costs of air pollution. Uh, the putting the monitor on the U.S. Embassy, I think, didn't help uh, or, or did help. And just kind of a recognition of, hey, this is not, we don't have to live like this. So that was an enormous step. And I think that then kind of kicked in the door a little bit of, well, we can have discussions with the U.S. Uh, on CO2, and we'll repackage our efforts to reduce air pollution on the international stage as being something about CO2, but domestically we're going to be very focused on uh, the, the, the air pollution and the health costs of that. And, you know, since then, you know, what China has done uh, has really, I think, been remarkable. And again, say, if you think in the Copenhagen 2009, would entirely not predictable. Now, it is worth noting, if you build all that in, you do, you brought down from the business as usual uh, 8.1 degrees Fahrenheit, but you only brought it down to 6.5 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century. I think there's a question back there. Um, hi, Professor. My question is about your claim. Uh, you mentioned that the biggest increase of fuel consumption would be in developing countries like China and India. And so you said that that's where we should focus our effort in reducing the consumption, fuel consumption. Is that right? No, so uh, I think it's, it's a very important question that you're asking. Uh, mm -hmm. China and India are in charge of China and India's energy consumption, and they're going to mm -hmm. be charge, in charge of the energy mix. So I was just pointing out some arithmetic. Uh, mm -hmm. If we're going to have large reductions in CO2, mm -hmm the kind of large reductions that would be necessary not to have 6.5 degrees Fahrenheit or whatever your favorite number is, just by pure math, they're going to have to come from India and China. That okay. doesn't mean India and China will want to do it. That doesn't mean they should want to do it. But there's no way to really bring down uh, CO2 emissions without a lot of that coming uh, in, in India and China. Now, who should pay for that mm -hmm. is a deeper question. Uh, and it's possible the rest of the world should pay for it. That's uh, a political question. But mechanically, if we're going to have big reductions in mm -hmm. what's emitted into the atmosphere, a lot of that will have to happen in India and China. Okay, so I have a follow-up question. Uh, but have you considered if we divide, if we calculate the per capita fuel consumption, and then uh, the U.S. per capita fuel consumption would be much higher than that of China or India because they have such a large... Uh, population. In that sense, shouldn't we focus more on reducing fuel consumption in U.S. and other developing, developed countries? Yeah, so that is at the heart, uh, this is what I tried to emphasize, why the climate challenge is so difficult, mm -hmm. uh, is that the very countries that are going to have to experience reductions, no matter who pays for it, could be paid for by the today's rich countries, uh, those countries are the very countries who need desperately increases in energy consumption and are not going to be super excited about paying three or four times uh, as, much, uh, as much for it. And you are also raising uh, an, another question of like, uh, what is the right amount uh, of energy consumption and how should, that be, uh, how should the energy consumption be distributed around the world? And that ultimately is going to be a political question uh, it's not something that I intend to, I, I intended to have a, express a clear view on. Okay, thank you. Let's take uh, two la final questions and then we can conclude. I think there's a question here and one back there. Uh, hi, my name is Rahul. I'm a first year PhD student here at the Humphrey School from India. I have a couple of questions. Firstly, with respect to the you know, distribution of energy subsidies. Uh, and I want your thoughts on this. I think a problem is that 
uh, a lot of, lot of the problem is with respect to how you count the poor, how the government is counting the poor, when they're doing it in a slightly broad manner for a large range of subsidies, and not perhaps particularly for the energy subsidy where things are slightly more different. So have you seen, do you think that's a problem, one, uh, at all? And do you see uh, efforts being made where you should separate out uh, you know, sort of your population based on the different kind of subsidies that you're giving? Do you think it'll be valuable and useful because it's going to be a costly exercise? Um, secondly, uh, with respect to the INDCs, and I think that from a you know, bottom-up process, that seems to be a reasonable uh, cumulative number that we've come to. Uh, might put you on the spot, but who do you think is pulling their weight and who's not from your analysis in this? And thirdly, just a comment, I think it's useful to separate India and China out and not club them into the same box. Uh, just kind of a following up from that comment, because we're looking at $15,000 per capita income versus, I think, of a fifth of that. Okay, uh, so there's a lot to unpack here. Let me see if I can get at least 25% of it. Um, number one on the energy subsidies, I actually think India is super well poised to be an absolute leader on this. And that's, they, they now have those cards that are linked, uh, the biometric cards that are linked to bank accounts. So the technology is in place. You could just put the money at, uh, in people's accounts based on their income level measured you know, somewhat in a complicated way, and you could remove all the energy subsidies. So that's like blackboard economics. Uh, the political uh, economy of that is not a no-brainer, but you have the technology in place in a way that, yeah, so, and that's, and actually I'm trying to work on experiments where we're gonna see if we can do that. So that's, that, 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 that's one. Uh, two, I think who is pulling their weight and who is not pulling their weight? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we in Minnesota are perfect. So. <laughs> well, we do know above average, right? <laughs> um, you, you know, I think, I, I don't know. That's a, you know. Well, I think this, that's rela very related to the previous question. Uh, should we be, Try, you know, but that it's related to some kind of. I think we kind of killed this idea at uh, when Copenhagen died. I think we kind of killed. Uh, so let me just mock. I'm sure this isn't true at the uh, at Minnesota, but like in uh, the Kennedy School version of the world, uh, we're all gonna like hold hands and kumbaya, and we're gonna join some global market uh, for carbon where we're all going to recognize it and we're all going to play by the same rules. Uh, and the world is way more messy than that. And so we're going to build these things very slowly and intermittently. But that would have allowed for some kind of assignment and then you could have had property rights and uh, you would have, could have fixed things up with permits, uh, giving away permits to different countries. I think that mechanism is gone. Uh, and then I, your third question uh, was, or did I get all of them? I think pretty much. There's more of a comment. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was just, you know what? I have a rule in life that there should never be more than two lines on a graph. Uh, and so that was unfair that I combined India and China. But. Why don't we take one last question? Hi, Nilab Narayan. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer. And I was particularly interested if, if you match these numbers in terms of lifestyles. Because really, the whole energy consumption is driven by social models and lifestyle models of how our cities are planned and how we you know, consume things. Uh, because that extrapolation may not be happening at the same rate. And then you're missing also Africa. Uh, India, China, Africa, all three are going to add much bigger numbers. So I think you made a very good point, solid point that we cannot sustain given how things are for the next 100 years. Um, but if you're looking at solutions, why look at solutions only on energy pricing and not at the real driver for that energy consumption, which is the lifestyle of different societies? OK, so that is a fabulous question. I'm just going to knock that one right out of the park here, all right? And, and I, I, will, an easy one I will reveal like, how narrow-minded I am in this answer. Uh, and you can walk out of here with a sense of moral superiority that I don't understand the way the world works. Uh, but as an economist, what's the answer? 
It's prices. <laughs> it's, no. All that stuff is a function of prices. Your norms and your this, your that, the way societies are formed, cities are shaped, that's all a function of the prices we set out and people respond to those prices. Was that, how was that? This, this is, now let me, I, 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 think, I think Michael hit it out of the park, but, but, just, to, but just to hit the park out of the park. <laughs> the, no, the, the, it is a depressing statement about human beings. Preaching, moralizing, and hoping to change lifestyle by rhetoric alone, we've tried that zillions of times. The depressing statement about people is when it finally comes down to making decisions, especially important pocketbook-oriented decisions, prices, 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 prices. That's, at the end of the day, what people seem to respond to. And may not, Adam Smith, in, in his, the theory of moral sentiments, describe that fundamental feature of human beings as depressing, but one that we should accept and design social policy accordingly. Having said all that, let's give Michael a great hand. One last observation. Michael thinks that it's a tragedy if the temperature goes up by four degrees. I, living in Minnesota, am not so <laughs> sure. <laughs>